Welcome everyone to Microsoft Ignite Into Focus, the show that brings you insights and analysis of the biggest news for Microsoft Ignite. For the next 30 minutes, we'll be looking closely at key announcements revealed during today's opening sessions. From the future of collaboration with Microsoft Mesh and Microsoft Teams to the many facets of Microsoft Dynamics 365 powering the next generation of supply chain insights. We'll also break down the next steps in AI innovation with Azure OpenAI and touch on the end-to-end -end security solutions helping protect it all. I am truly excited, and I know our guests are too, to dive into these key themes for the next half hour as we aim to equip and empower you to take on the many IT opportunities that lie ahead. Speaking of guests, you'll know her from her coverage of Microsoft for ZDNet and him from the industry staple, therot.com. They're also the dynamic duo of Windows Weekly. Welcome to Microsoft Ignite, Mary Jo Foley and Paul Therot. Thanks, great to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, our third guest has brought his talents of analysis to the EK Media Group as their chief of research, a former VP at Gartner focusing on cloud, edge, and IT transformation, which makes him pretty perfect for this show. Please welcome Eli Knasser. Eli, thank you so much for joining. Hey there, thanks for having me. Okay, so let's jump right in with a look at Microsoft Chairman and Chief Executive Officer Satya Nadella's keynote. What were some of the announcements that made headlines for you? Mary Jo, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, for me, the biggest news I would say was the Microsoft Loop technologies. I've been wondering what had happened to all the fluid framework stuff that Microsoft announced a couple years ago, and this is the answer, right? Loop is the rebranding of some of the components of Fluid Framework, but it's more. It's also a new standalone collaboration app uh, that I think is going to be really interesting because it um, it's going to it's going to bring you another yet another way to collaborate beyond what you have with Teams now, but also integrate with Teams. Gotcha. I noticed we almost had an interloper there trying we to did. join you on screen. <laughs> I'm very excited. I didn't know he was here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very Sorry excited about, about Loop. Too. No, it's for those watching at home, we are truly live in case you were wondering. Um, Paul, what's top of mind for you off of Satya's keynote? Honestly, it was it was more of a general thought that we're kind of moving past the cloud first, mobile first era into what he described as an era of ubiquitous computing and ambient intelligence. And I, he had a quote where he said, we're going to experience more digitization in the next 10 years than we had in the previous 40 which I thought was really interesting. Um, obviously, the COVID pandemic era has not been great and is not a good thing, but it's interesting to me how it has kind of jump-started this push to a future I think we're heading to anyway, right? But I think it's it, it has sped up because of the pandemic. Absolutely. I'm, I'm super excited to see how we're going to harness that ambient intelligence in the next 10 years. Um, and Eli, what, what stood out for you? Yeah, so, so for me, it was a mixture of both what Marianne and, and Paul said. I think the amount of digitization that's going to be created is going to have a pretty significant impact on IT professionals, on tech professionals, and how we're going to cope with this idea of you know, a distributed infrastructure, infrastructure is everywhere, data is being created everywhere, uh, security needs to be everywhere. How are we going to manage more efficiently, more optimally? How are we going to monitor all of these things? I think that becomes a sort of Herculean effort on our part, but I think the vision, I really enjoyed the keynote, the vision was, was spot on, uh, but then translating that into what we need to do. And I think some of the announcements, like Azure Arc specifically, the hybrid and multi-cloud approaches, I think those were, were really spot on uh, from that perspective. Awesome. So, you know, obviously lots of key, well, they're all sort of key takeaways here. <laughs> um, I wanted to, you know, Eli, just touch on a little bit more. I, I know you you love the cloud. How are you feeling about the Azure OpenAI service that we were talking about today? 
So, I mean, I think that's complementary. So uh, I think that will that will bring um, uh, all of the capabilities of artificial intelligence to these different types of workloads, to being able to do um, AI, whether it's on multi-cloud, whether it's hybrid, whether it's at the edge or on-premises. I think that becomes um, important, complementary, especially as we move into, again, um, the digitization, you know, increased digitization. I think that becomes that becomes crucial for us to be able to move forward. Yeah, cool. Well, we're definitely going to spend some more time talking on Azure, but I'm going to turn back to Paul here for a second. You you mentioned, you know, hybrid is is really kind of here to stay, uh, whether we like it or not. How how are you feeling about uh, Teams Connect? And, and Mary Jo, feel free to chime in on Loop as well. We're seeing this rise of collaboration tools that are not just spanning your team, but inter-team, inter-company, inter-industry sometimes. I mean, Teams is the center of everything that Microsoft is doing with productivity and, and hybrid work, obviously. So Teams is, is job one. Teams Connect is, is interesting and necessary because it allows orga people in organizations to bring in individuals or teams from other organizations and establish that trust model and collaborate in real time, which is great. I, I, I can't believe we've gotten this far into this and haven't mentioned the metaverse, uh -huh. right? um, you know, channeling uh, Neil Stevenson here. and. It's, it's semi-fascinating to me that almost 25 years ago, I used to watch Microsoft events, uh, briefings in, in a movie theater that were, you know, that you would broadcast over uh, satellite. And we talked back then about this kind of metaverse situation. Of course, then it was very cartoony and low tech and uh, not quite up to the capabilities we have today, but here we are and we're living in the future all of a sudden. It's, it's fascinating. <laughs> to me that this is coming together now. Absolutely. All that you know was missing like? were NFTs today. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you, know, you know what I like about Microsoft's take on this though is they bring the enterprise take to the metaverse, right? So we heard Meta, AKA Facebook's take last week on this, but Microsoft's is really different, right? It's very much more applied. It's about things like digital twins and Azure IoT. And now with Mesh for Teams, it's going to bring Teams into the equation. I don't know, I feel like for business customers, that makes it a little more tangible and a little less cartoony, even though avatars can look like cartoons. I think it's you know, still very, you know, yeah, more applied. I mean, the cartoon things I think is a little fun, but honestly, I think it's something we can all relate to, which is just camera fatigue. Um, the yes. past year and a half, people who have never been in front of a web camera have been forced to, you know, work from home, dress up a little bit, kind of, you know, try to make themselves presentable and then deal with that stress and fear of interacting in that virtual way. And I think this is a neat way for people to do that without having to be, have the camera on them at all times, you know, yeah, um, it's I, more that of an alone. evolution too. Right, Paul, it's an evolution above and beyond just having to interact with teams to, you know, being actually productive. So not just as a result of the, the COVID pandemic and forcing us to be in front of a camera, but to also leverage the metaverse for productivity purposes, um, regardless. Yeah, and and, and I, I don't have this set up at home, but I don't know that any of us do, but uh, there's a 2D experience, which is what we're talking about, but there's also that 3D mixed reality experience. And that allows you to move around in a space and and really emulate real life. I mean, I I I get a little worried about a dystopian future where we never <laughs> interact in person. I, I I desperately I'm hoping that the next time we do something like this, it's in person. Uh, but this is an amazing capability that allows uh, Microsoft and the and the companies to follow Microsoft technology to um, implement that and in a hybrid sense, so that you have the people who are there and then the people who aren't there physically as well can all contribute. Yeah, as uh, as someone who's worked on a hybrid team even before we were all sort of pushed into this, um, I miss the the hallway conversations. There's something to yeah. be said for walking by your uh, manager's desk and popping in for a quick question. Oh, without having there are a lot of people who are going to get awkward hugs the first time I see them. It's <laughs> this, this I know. Is the way it's gonna be. <laughs> I I warned my teammates. We we did like an outdoor thing uh, recently, <laughs> and I was like, hugs, hugs, hugs. Um, yep. <laughs> okay, let's let's dive deep into some of these core sessions here. Um, we've already started, but let's let's dive even deeper. So we. Heard heard the word hyperconnected a lot during Jared Spataro's core theme session. What do you think about that concept and, and some of the new integrations that Jared mentioned? And Paul, we'll start with you. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, when you look at Microsoft 365, which has its roots in Office, I mean, you've got this incredible legacy business and these productivity tools that we've all used for many decades. And then this need to kind of adapt to this new world and this new world of work and then hybrid work and so forth. And so you see that. And again, a lot of it gets pumped right through Microsoft Teams, which to me makes tons of sense. Um, like Mary Jo, I'm really very curious about what's happening with Fluid Framework as it moves into Microsoft Loop, uh, what that looks like. I, I, you know, Mary Jo and I collaborate in uh, using OneNote today, which is kind of an old school product now. It's over 20 years old, I think. Um, this kind of real time hyper connectivity in this new platform to me is very, very interesting. And um, I can't wait to, I, I want to be a cartoon, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I also want to try some of this new uh, real-time collaboration uh, functionality in Loop. Yeah, and and Mary Jo, you mentioned Loop earlier. Anything you want to add about what you hope to see or, or what you might be speculating is going on there? Well, I saw a lot of questions on Twitter during the keynote today about is Loop a replacement for OneNote, which I think is interesting, right? And yeah. you can ask that about a lot of different Microsoft products, like, is it a replacement for Teams? No, not really. Is it a replacement for Visio? No, not really. Not OneNote either. <laughs> so I think right. I think people are trying to figure out, like, where does this fit in? And one of the products I am super interested to see it integrate with is Whiteboard, right? Because I asked Microsoft, how does um, Loop actually work with Whiteboard? And so here's their answer, which is very interesting. Uh, you can have loop components that go into whiteboard or whiteboard can become a loop <laughs> component. So you can yep. do collaboration your way, just like a Big Mac. It's, it's the same thing, you know, oh. have it your way. Have it your way, love it. Um, yeah. Eli, being our, so, you know, sorry, go for it. What, what, what would you like no, to no, add? No, 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 please, sorry. <laughs> I, I was gonna ask, you know, we, we've talked about loop and how that sort of interconnects with hyperconnected, but I'd love to get your take on sort of bringing that ambient data and AI. We heard a little bit about context IQ and how it's gonna give us the information when we need it, where we need it. And I was wondering how, what you're thinking about that. So I, again, I, I think this all goes back to this idea that everything is distributed and because everything is distributed, we need to be able to make or give actionable advice immediately. And, and I think that becomes really crucial um, that, that we're able to, to be empowered to do something uh, to do something like that. So uh, I think all of these will flow in very nicely. Back to that hyper-connected as well. I think that has to also evolve beyond just the supply chain, some of the, the apps that we saw integrations. I think even the hyperscale cloud providers need to be able to, to interconnect, to integrate between themselves a lot more than what we're seeing today. I think Microsoft is taking a, a good first step with the integration with AWS SSO, for example, but I think we need a lot more than that from, from a hyper connectivity at the hyperscaler level as well. Oh man. Could I you know, chime in on, I want to chime yeah. in on context yeah, IQ. Go for it. I was super, I, I was super <laughs> interested. Okay, yeah. So um, Charles Lamana said something very interesting during his presentation. He said, context IQ shows the integration of dynamics and office like never before. And I was like, I didn't think of it that way, but yeah, because Microsoft has been integrating Dynamics with Office and Teams and Outlook um, little by little. But now when you have something like the set of AI capabilities and Context IQ, and even with Loop too, you can start really mixing and matching things between Dynamics and these other platforms in a way that make it feel truly seamless instead of just saying it's seamless. Yeah, right. absolutely. So, you know, two of the things I really like about Microsoft is that it has a way of and it, very explicitly about meeting its customers where they are, meaning it's platform agnostic, whether we're talking in the cloud or in the client or whatever. And I think that's r really smart and the right thing to do for customers. But the second one is also just kind of putting the functionality, the power where people need it. You know, is something as basic as integrating Context IQ into Microsoft Editor is a way to, you know, it's, it's you know, we've had spell checking since the 1980s probably, or the very early 1990s. And you kind of bring it forward, you know, grammar checking. Right, right, which is this other major technology Microsoft's been talking about for several years. It sounds kind of big and squishy and what is it and how does this work and how does this impact me on my daily basis? But on a, in a very basic level, Something as simple as I am typing a message that might have something to do with a coworker or something to go on with work, and this thing being able to predict, 
intelligently what you're going for and get you there without you having to lose your context and, and figure out where things are and uh, look elsewhere for that information. So it's genius. Yeah, I I loved when Outlook would let me know if I didn't attach the attachment and save me that embarrassment. <laughs> and I'm really excited for it to be able to tell me, hey, send this meeting right now so that next week doesn't come around and you figure out uh, you forgot to do that. So. As we're talking about all these innovations, let's sort of segue over um, to hear your thoughts on Alyssa Taylor's um, segment on building you know, a hyper-connected business. So we'll transition a little bit more into the business. And let's start with something that I think is on a lot of people's minds these days, supply chain insights. Um, I think every other you know, day I hear something about the supply chain. So um, Eli, do you want to give us a little bit of your thoughts on on how you know supply chain insights might be impacting the world and industries we're in right now? Well, so I mean, one of the challenges right now is being able to coordinate all of the different things that that a business needs uh, for to, to fulfill its supply chain. So I think from that perspective, this helps uh, not just coordinate but also create a level of governance and a level of continuity so that uh, the different businesses are able to communicate and be proactive in terms of what they need as opposed to being reactive. Uh, so from that perspective, I think uh, I think this will be a, a truly a game changer. Yeah, and Mary Jo, I know um, you've done a lot of work on sort of the supply chain insights and its integration with Dynamics 365. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, not specific to to supply chain insights, but just again, the idea that Microsoft is really, so first I should say, this is the five year anniversary of the launch of Dynamics 365 wow. this week. Um, and it's really interesting as someone who's watched it from the beginning of when it launched to now, because in the old days you had two things, you had ERP, CRM, couldn't talk to each other, silos, right? Mm -hmm. And now where Microsoft's been going with Dynamics is really interesting. It's breaking things up into modules, things like supply chain insights and all the other ones that exist and making these able to be used in a mix and match way so that customers don't have to commit to a giant monolithic ERP or CRM suite. They can just say, oh, I want supply, in supply chain insights. I want to mix it with a third party product. I want to mix this with teams. I want to bring all these things together. And that's actually starting to be possible now. And that's a, a much more exciting vision than just trying to sell ERP or CRM. Yeah, I, I feel like breaking it up also makes it easier for folks to ha get just what they need, right? We don't have to right. hand them a, a huge piece of software that they ignore you know, 50% of. Paul, anything you'd like to add before we start talking more about the cloud? <laughs> I might be experiencing a technical difficulty No here. worries. Um, okay, sorry. Um, no, I mean, not so much. I mean, I, I, to me, obviously the, the supply chain issues are something we're gonna be dealing with for a long time and impact many industries. But I think this is another example of where Microsoft is putting that technology it has in the right place in this case in the form of AI insights into uh, helping those companies, um, you know, get back up and running as quickly as they can. So, I mean, nothing, nothing dramatic to add there. So. Yeah, no, no worries. Just wanted to offer the opportunity, of course. Okay, so now we're gonna segue into AI that uh, is a bit everywhere these days. And of course, Scott Guthrie session, uh, theme session was all about ARC and Azure Container Apps, what the data looks like, our new cloud pieces. So Eli, as our you know self-proclaimed cloud person uh, from your intro, <laughs> why don't you kick us off? What did you think about the session? What do you ultimately think it means for our users? Yeah, so I think for, for uh, Microsoft users in particular, Arc is uh, is a really good uh, a really good start to centralize the management of um, distributed workloads, whether they're containers or not. Again, on premises in a hybrid environment or in a multi cloud environment, and at the edge. Um, because you're able to manage everything from that sort of single pane of glass, you're able to do the provisioning, you're able to do the governance. That will help users, professionals, IT professionals in specifically, to be able to scale their operations. The challenge that IT professionals have today is everything is so diverse, like there's different platforms and you have to do diff things differently on each individual platform. Arc is a really good attempt at 
consolidating, centralizing this, giving them the tools, the ability to manage whether it's the uh, container clusters that they have, the new container apps that, that were announced today, uh, or these different silos um, everywhere. I think that will be important. Uh, the other thing that, that Arc, I think, um, brings to the table is that it allows you to, to now bring uh, cloud native capabilities to these different environments. So for example, cloud enabling um, uh, workloads or being able to, to support uh, containers with AI capabilities. So running AI on top of the Kubernetes cluster, being able to, to get insights out of that, uh, that becomes very, very powerful. So I think Arc is, um, in my opinion, uh, a really good message that Microsoft has towards how to manage your hybrid cloud, how to manage your multi-cloud, but more importantly, how you're able to get some of these cloud native services, these containerized cloud native services, getting them into these different locations uh, and managing them in a uniform manner. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I saw lots of nods. I was going to ask if there's uh, if you wanted to chime in here. Yeah, I mean, Eli is right, and and I, Microsoft is uniquely situated to bring business, especially forward into this cloud hybrid era, right? So, as uh, businesses move workloads off of on-prem uh, infrastructure and move more and more to the cloud, the ability to manage that stuff from a central location is obviously key. Um, and again, it speaks to what I said earlier, just Microsoft's meeting customers where they are. It is also a multi-cloud world, that's the reality. Customers are going to have AWS, they're going to have Google, they're going to have some combination of these things. And so working with the competition is the right thing to do for customers. Was there any piece in particular that you think, that you were very excited about, particularly in this multi-cloud world? Yeah. Well, I, honestly, I'm kind of the client guy. So to me, the big deal here is honestly, uh, Azure, Azure Virtual Desktop, and the ability to bring that down to uh, uh, Azure Stack HCI, right? And 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 allow uh, businesses to run uh, Windows 10 and now Windows 11 PCs uh, through their data centers or through the cloud. Amazing, yeah, I can only imagine our, our large enterprises are gonna like that. Mary Jo, anything you'd like to add on here about Azure and our cloud offerings? Yeah, I think it was really interesting to hear not just Scott talking about multi-cloud, but to, to hear how he's positioning the Microsoft Cloud, right? So Microsoft Cloud, when, when people hear that, they think, oh, it's just a bunch of disparate products that Microsoft talks about as a bucket, right? But if you kind of dig a little deeper, there are all these levels of the stack that now make up a cohesive Microsoft Cloud. So it's not just Azure, and it's not just Microsoft 365, not just Dynamics, it's the whole thing and it's actually starting to be integrated together. Uh, when you add in things like Synapse and you add in Dataverse, it feels like, oh, there really is a real stack there and it's not just a bunch of words under the Microsoft Cloud label. Yeah. I think that's very important. I think what Mary Jo just said is very important. Um, kudos to Microsoft because Microsoft is doing two things. Yeah. The other thing that's very important is each individual application, each individual piece of software that Microsoft is releasing has hybrid capabilities inherent into it. Like take a look at Windows, for example. Windows had a, has a lot of synergies with Azure. SQL Server already had a lot of synergies with Azure in terms of stretch clusters and a whole bunch of other things. And it looks like SQL Server 22 is going to be even, it's going to accelerate that even more, whether it's containerized or more synergies with Azure, whether it's the visual basic. So Microsoft is kind of hitting two birds with one stone. They're attacking it from the software perspective is becoming very much hybrid, but they're also building all of these other integrations to make it uh, multi-cloud and make it available everywhere. I think that combination brings that entire story together. And I agree, we're definitely starting to see an end-to-end -end cohesive story with, uh, with these different products. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like uh, Scott Guthrie probably gets a, a bonus check every time he says elasticity, um, but there's <laughs> there's, a, there's a real reality to that. And and, uh, and uh, again, you know, just making those capabilities uh, available across multiple clouds and across both on-prem, hybrid, and pure cloud is just uh, is very smart. Yeah, indeed. Okay, so our last topic of the day is a hot one for anyone with a digital presence, security. So in his keynote, Satya reminded us that cybercrime is costing the world six trillion, with a T, dollars every year. Was anyone else like surprised when you saw that number? <laughs> like I did a double take. Um, 
And, and in her theme session, Basu Jakal talked about some of the new security, privacy, and identity updates designed to enable boundaryless collaboration. So, you know, we, we see that six trillion number. I think if I remember, uh, about a third of cybersecurity attacks are on small, medium businesses, and two thirds of them can't operate after an attack like that. So if you're a business owner, how much emphasis do you put on sort of end-to-end -end security solutions like Windows Defender for Business? And Eli, I'll, I'll start off with you. Or, you know, alternatively, like how much of an impact do you think a solution like this is going to have? I think it'll have a lot. Now, I'm not a security expert, but I do have an opinion here. I, th I think it'll <laughs> impact a lot, <laughs> especially for small businesses. And I think that's why they go after small businesses. They're easier targets. And, you know, you attack a small business, it's harder to, to, to recover from that, which is why I think it's crucial. It's important for, for businesses to realize that as we move closer to digitization, as we move closer to a lot of the messages that we heard Satya and team deliver today, whether it's the metaverse or others, any everything is becoming um, uh, reliant on digital. So as a result, small businesses would have to put an emphasis on security, whether it's things like Defender or uh, taking it a step further. But I think security becomes fundamental. I mean, my dad, for example, owns a restaurant and, and I joke around all the time and say, this is no longer a restaurant. When I look at the amount of tech that's in there, it's a digital business, right? <laughs> when, when they've got online ordering systems, they've got POS. Any attack on any of these well, renders the restaurant kind of, uh, it cripples the restaurant. Whether you have the staff there, if you're not getting orders, it's not going to help. So I think security becomes uh, fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. Paul, do you have something to add in there? Yeah, uh, I'd like to add that I'm also not a security expert, but I... I <laughs> All right, I everyone was, raise uh, your hand if you're not a security <laughs> expert but has an opinion. Uh, I was fascinated uh, by the notion that... Uh, small business is the big target. And that makes sense, right? You go after the low hanging fruit. I mean, um, I, I like the whole zero trust idea. I like this notion of always operating as if you're in breach right now, that you don't necessarily trust even the people that you know uh, at this moment, right? It's it's the right approach to, uh, to things. And, and I work for a small business. This is something that we struggle with. Um, and it's, it's, it's very important uh, that Microsoft take this approach. Our, our data is all out in the world, and uh, obviously it has to be protected. Indeed. I was personally pretty excited to see that we're, we're also enabling these hybrid cloud scenarios, right? We're extending Microsoft Defender for AWS. Mary Jo, any, any thoughts on, that you'd like to add? Um, I think it's very interesting to see not just uh, the zero trust conversation Microsoft's trying to have with customers, but also the idea of a trust fabric, I guess, because mm. I'm a platform person, I, I think that way. <laughs> and so, so when you hear Microsoft talking about the trust fabric and Azure Active Directory being at the core of that, again, it kind of brings us around to the idea that everything is getting more and more integrated. And when you have Azure Active Directory at the core, you can do a lot of interesting things like the Teams Connect technology. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're when you're having the shared the shared channels, you can ensure that those are secure because they're built on top of Azure AD. Yeah, I really like the idea of sort of in this hybrid world, you're no longer just using the laptop or desktop on your machine. Right. You're using a personal device. And at its core, it's really about identity and understanding who you're talking to on the other side. Right. And we need that flexibility. All right. Now, that is all the time we've got. Time truly flies when you're having fun with three new <laughs> Ignite friends. I want to say a huge thank you to our guests, Mary Jo Foley, Paul Therott, and Eli Knasser. I really appreciated hearing your insights. They're truly invaluable, and we've loved the time you've spent with us. If you've missed any of our show or would like to rewatch the discussions, head over to the session scheduler and search Microsoft Ignite into focus.